Vicariously Podcast, stories and insights from unique entrepreneurs successfully pursuing their passion. All set. We are headed to Isle Paddleboards to meet with Mark Miller, one of the co-founders. I am stoked. Been waiting for this for a while. I think he's going to have a really good story. All right. We are getting started. I am sitting here with one of the co-founders of Isle Paddleboards, Mr. Mark Miller. Good morning. <laughs> Introduce yourself. Tell us uh, where you're from, how you got here. Just give us a quick snapshot of, of who you are, Mark. Well, let's see. Born and raised in San Diego, uh, specifically South San Diego, most southwesterly corner of the U.S., uh, Coronado and Imperial Beach. Pretty much raised around water my whole life. As early as I can remember, I think my mom or dad threw me in the pool, and then we ended up moving to the beach and just sort of fell in love with the ocean and and surfing. Nice. So the reason that Mark is on here today is because Mark, along with one of his other friends, and co- is a co-founder of Isle Surf and Sup. So they do paddle boards, they do surfboards, they do all the accessories. Am I forgetting anything? That's about it. You nailed it. So, These days, it's a lot, a lot more paddle boards than surfboards due to due to the big popularity boom in in paddle boarding. So so yeah, everyone's caught the bug, which is a good thing because I I want to go back and start from the beginning. The fact that your company actually started in 2004 and judging by <laughs> your limited number of gray hairs, you are not, you're not deep in your 50s and 60s. You're a young buck in your late 30s, early 40s, I'm guessing. Bless so, you. Bless you. <laughs> so I want to hear the story about how you got into it, how this, this company started in 2004. Oh man, how far do I want to go back? <laughs> Yeah, well, the idea initially came about um, back when I was in college in UCSB. So it's actually a pretty funny story. I was on the surf team, and this is when eBay was sort of all the rage. Um, a lot of people were selling on eBay, and we we kind of lived in a surf compound and on the side of the house underneath the beer bottles <laughs> and the kegs and whatever <laughs> else was there were a bunch of sometimes broken, buckled, beat up surfboard. So I had an idea. Hey, why don't I? Oh, and at the time I had no money. So when you have no money, it, your wheels start turning a little, a little <laughs> quicker and to, to take a board and clean it up and uh, put it on eBay. So I, I did that and I started at a dollar and lo and behold, uh, after three, five, seven days, I can't even remember it was so far back. Uh, the board had climbed up to $380 and I was like, whoa. And the board was pretty much, it was in one piece, but it was brown and just trashed and it sold. And I was like, wow, that, that's cool. How am I going to get it there? (laughs) So I, I uh, figured out through Greyhound, um, that you could ship boards on the, on the bus for cheap. And I pretty much wrapped it in, I think it was, uh, insulation of a house and shipped it off really cheap somewhere, (laughs) Uh, inland, I think. So there was just this market of people. No one had ever really listed boards online. And this was back in 2000, probably, or probably 2002. And, and then I just sort of did that through the end of college on the side. And it was a good little, little side business. And then when the, the people around my buddies around the house kind of caught wind, they wanted their cut because they were throwing <laughs> their, their, boards off the side of the house and I was selling them. So that was kind of how the, the light bulb went off that, wow, there, there's a market online, not specifically tied to the coast of people that just want to buy surfboards. And, and so that was kind of the initial light bulb kind of fast forward beyond that. Uh, you know, I graduated college and had no money again. So I needed a full-time job, bills to pay, you know, the, the whole deal. So I jumped right into the, to the mortgage industry, uh, on the marketing side, the good friend of mine who started a loan by phone chop shop, <laughs> if you will. <laughs> and we rode, well, I rode that up with him to, uh, I think at the end before the bubble popped, uh, we had over a hundred employees started with none and the company was doing a few million 
a month in commission revenue and I was managing all the marketing, which was all on the digital side. We were generating leads online. So I never really got to make the big bucks, like some of these loan officer taxi cab drivers that were making <laughs> 50K a month. And then uh, I just hated it. So uh, that's when I reached out to Doug, uh, a good friend of mine. He's a little brother of one of my best friends from Coronado. And he was also in a in a corporate job after college that he disliked. And I said, I think I have an idea. <laughs> Let's sell surfboards online. And he was game. I was game. And his dad had a garage with cars and oil on the ground <laughs> in National City, where the company still is today, in a business park. And we, he first wa borrowed money from his father, or I'm sorry, his brother, uh, a loan. Uh, it was enough just to purchase the, the first shipment. And we pretty much uh, started out of a garage in National City with a loan from his brother. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so did it start with the name Isle Paddleboards or Isle Surf or yeah, Surf so and Sup? Yeah, so we initially... So the business model was was unique where we were going direct to consumer and this was before direct direct to consumer had kind of a stigma, especially in the surfboard uh, industry. And we were also going to design the boards here and have them produced overseas. So to bring the cost way down and kind of stay out of the production other than the initial designs here in San Diego and really focus on the graphics, the website and that direct to consumer model. But really initially, you know, we got a slow start and didn't really sell much online. We were, we started the business on eBay selling the boards at dollar auction. So nice. everything was started at a dollar and there was such a market at the time. No one had had this idea that we were actually moving a ton of product, not a ton, but uh, enough to eventually within two years, uh, I was able to quit my job. Doug started out on his own and we were actually able to, to make enough to basically pay the, Go full -time. Yeah, have some ramen and, <laughs> and, you know, pay your electric bill in your small apartment. But at the time it was tough because I was at the peak of the mortgage bubble before it popped. And I'm pretty sure my boss, he was under 30, he was driving a Ferrari. He had a penthouse downtown. <laughs> we were going all over the world. I was kind of riding his coattails, uh, which was nice. It was a good time because I was more on the marketing side. So I wasn't really making the big commissions like the loan officers. So I, and I, I just hated it other than, you know, riding the coattails and having fun on that side. And I, I really just walked away and it was, uh, it was a tough decision at the time, but it was probably one of the best decisions I ever made. And about six months after I walked away, uh, the bubble popped <laughs> <laughs> and the U S economy, uh, pretty much was brought to its knees by all these bad loans. And, uh, he went from zero to a hundred and a hundred back to zero, <laughs> maybe um, even maybe below zero. <laughs> it, it was below zero. So, wow. It, I mean, I couldn't have picked a better time yeah. to, to maybe exit. Um, but yeah, it was, it just wasn't for me. And, you know, I, I got in full time to the board thing. That's, that's a really tough decision. So I'm guessing, so that's like 2006, 2007 ish. And you're, yeah. So we started in 04 and then, yeah, I did did about two years with the mortgage company yeah. Moonlighting, which I remember one of my best visions. I had to come to National City and now I live in Mission Hills. When I come to work, I watch the traffic on the other side. When I leave, I watch the traffic on the yeah. other side. And I, I worked over in Mission, uh, Mission Valley. So I would work all day, then sit in traffic to come to National City to pack boards <laughs> And I remember punching my steering wheel going, this is insane. <laughs> like, I can't burn this candle. Uh, you know, this candle's out of wax after about two years. Yeah. And then eventually we built it up by then to, to where we had enough. And I was able to, to walk away from the mortgage. And I'm also thinking, just from my own standpoint, I'm not saying I party a lot. <laughs> However, <laughs> I know where I was in, you know, three, four years out, out of college. So I was living in San Francisco and, um, my friends didn't have Ferraris, but they had plenty of money and I definitely lived a rich life. I thoroughly enjoyed it. 
I was early 20s. I never had any money my my previous however many years. Now all of a sudden I'm getting VIP treatment and we're we're going out and ripping it. So oh, it was yeah. really <laughs> I I envy you for being yeah. able to walk away at that and time. And it was hard because a lot of my good friends were at the company and you know they were still for a while you know, making those big checks and yeah. going out downtown. It was a time you would go out downtown and the nightclubs would literally have Ferrari, Lamborghini, Bentley, you know, 10 different exotic cars and you'd walk in and everyone was mortgage this, real estate that. It was just young people making hand over fist with these this boom and but eventual yeah. bust in real estate. So it was tough for sure. And then, you know, to see it all come tumbling down <laughs> was... See? So your scary. Your dreams and aspirations at that point are riding on. You don't have to share the exact loan amount, but roughly. Uh, yeah. So the first loan I think was, if I can even remember, twenty grand maybe. It was enough to purchase one twenty foot container uh, from a factory overseas that we had uh, coordinated with on that first shipment, and and then it was just let's get them and throw them on eBay and on the website, which at the time the website was doing next to nothing and just roll the dice and it just progressed so from, from a, there. From a design perspective, you and Doug both grew up as diehard surfers. So that so you knew the technical side, you knew what you wanted to develop on a on a sheer equipment side. And then it was just a matter of getting correct production and cheap enough costs overseas. Yeah. I mean in a nutshell, I mean we definitely have been surfing our entire lives. And so we had industry connections with people who actually shaped boards and helped us kind of come up with that production catalog, just a variety, really trying to more appeal to the to the mass mass market of beginner intermediate surfers, which is really kind of the I would say the the larger part of the market and uh, kind of design the boards and and really truly that beginner intermediate market, you know, they definitely want a great shape that that works and and we that was you know part of the design but also you know graphics are are key so having a graphic that offers more of a, a mass appeal versus you know these one-off kind of crazy graphics so it was more just mass appeal beginner intermediate and then we did go off and do a couple couple graphics i remember with some you know girls posing on the board silhouettes and <laughs> and and they actually they actually did pretty well i remember at the time we were laughing thinking back to these graphics and this was a, a long time ago so at what point did you steer uh, so you you obviously started with surfboards and what were they made out of fiberglass yeah so traditional surfboards polyurethane foam and fiberglass fiberglass cloth and then you and polyester resin and then you eventually um, expanded to stand-up paddle boards. At what point was that? Because this is, I have a ton of questions in, in this regard, and <laughs> yeah. I'll get to that in a second. But when did that transition? Yeah, so started the company in 04, and then really, you know, we tapped into this niche of sort of beginner, intermediate surfers who purchased boards online, didn't have access to a surf shop or the surf shops that they did have access to. The boards were sky high because everything was uh, being produced here domestically and was just prices, retail prices were, were off, you know, twice as much as, as our uh, online direct to consumer price delivered nationwide. So so we, we saw the business grow pretty much. Uh, I mean, I'm just trying to think the numbers off the top of my head, but I would say kind of 100% growth every year, just, you know, growing and growing and growing. And then everyone else joined the party. So a lot of other people came in, saw that business model that they could produce pretty high quality boards overseas, build a website. And we, at the time, had eBay was slowly kind of diminishing. And uh, so we kind of weaned ourselves off eBay as the business grew and started to sell more and more off the site to eventually where we were 100% off of eBay and moved to 100% web sales. And then as all these new entrants entered the market to compete with our business model, we saw sales just sort of flatten out after about, I would say, five or six years. And so we were scratching our heads <laughs> going, uh-oh, you know, what do we, what do we do? We need, you know, more growth. 
end. I can't remember. I think I saw Laird, the grand, the grandpappy of paddleboarding. I think I saw him in a magazine and, and it caught my eye and I was like, I got to do that. And so the factory had gotten a few orders for paddle boards. And so I just kind of put together a production design for one. And at the time, no one really knew. So I just, it was huge. So I just kind of put something together, had the factory produce me. I think it was like 12 foot by 33 inches, uh, just a beast popsicle <laughs> stick. <laughs> And, and uh, threw it in one of our shipments, and uh, and I hopped on that thing, and I was like, this is one of the funnest. So me, I'm a diehard surfer through and through. I like big waves. I like, you know, I've traveled a greater part of the world chasing bigger waves, hollower waves. And here in San Diego, the, the waves really a lot of the time are gutless, small, and I find myself as I year, years and years of surfing, it's hard to get excited on the small gutless days. Like when you're a Grom, you get amped up and you, you'll go out in anything and stay out all day. And so the paddleboard allowed me, I had this big 12 foot popsicle stick and I would take it on these gutless little days where I'd normally just turn around. And I never really got into longboarding and I'd get out there and I'd find myself catching 20, 30, 50, 60. I don't even know how many waves nonstop, just like a merry-go-round on a day that I probably, if I brought my surfboard out, would catch none to a handful and do a lot of sitting. Uh, or if I had a longboard, cool, but I'd still be knee paddling lay down paddling most of the time. And this allowed me to sort of stand up. So I got addicted quick and so addicted that <laughs> I found myself reaching for that board more than my surfboard because the surf tended to be gutless, uh, you know, more times than not. Uh, so, so yeah, I was hooked and, and I was like, I think there's, there's something here. Uh, and, and that was pretty much, I can't really remember the date, but had to have been around, where are we, 2018? So that must have 17. been like 20, 2017, yeah. That must, that must have been 2012, maybe? Uh, yeah. Trying to, trying to think back. And so uh, we just kind of went all in. And so we, I think 2006, I read a big article about a stand-up paddle, was when Laird... Uh, the grand grandpappy of SUP brought the first paddleboard to, and I think it was September 11th uh, oh. of 2006 to Malibu. And he had a big American flag and he paddled into the lineup and proceeded to no way. <laughs> take uh, many waves to, and everyone uh, either loved it and wanted one. Or uh, if you don't know uh, Laird's website, I'm pretty sure he has a t-shirt that says blame Laird. <laughs> Uh, wanted to kill him. And so <laughs> that's actually another topic we can maybe go into later. But uh, obviously paddle boards give you a lot more paddle power and you can be very disrespectful to a lineup and uh, <laughs> create a lot of friends quick, especially if you don't know what you're doing. Um, or especially in these very, um, you know, crowded and protected and localized spots. Some are even still localized where you, you paddle out in a sup, you know, there's a good chance someone's someone's going to take a swing at you or you're going to get in a major altercation. But uh, so, yeah, that was in 06 and, and it just slowly, slowly progressed. And then I, I got involved in, in probably, yeah, 20, 2010, 2011. And then I think our first shipments probably started coming in, you know, 2012. 2013, we put together an order, just really big boards and with not really meant to be more dangerous weapons in the surf. So we were more targeting the flat, flat water market and the cruisers, and the, the cruisers. And, and lo and behold, uh, initially, you know, they, they did, they did okay. And surfboards what was outpacing, you know, sales on an annual basis. Surfboards were still uh, outpacing paddle boards. And then, uh, after a few years, it really, really started to pick up steam because everyone, um, and not only for on the surf surf side, the steam really came from the inland markets. So that bug that I had caught, which was just that continuous glide, great exercise, being able to constantly paddle, constantly catch waves. Well, people in the inland market that never surfed before, I mean, surfing the glide is the hook. You know, you're using sort of nature's energy to flow across the water and it gives you this really unique feeling that sort of pulls you in. And that's why here I am 
25 years later, still like a little kid when the waves are good. I'm like, get me out there, get me out there. I probably haven't gone, gone a week or two in the, since I started surfing without being in the water. So you're hooked. And it was taking that feeling. And then sort of the person in Arkansas who had maybe seen surfing, been to Hawaii, but never did it and saw paddleboarding. Now they could get on a paddleboard and sort of get the paddle in hand and, and glide standing up across water. So it's almost like you're getting a similar feeling to surfing, albeit it's, it's different. And, and they got the bug, they got hooked. And then they told their friends, their friends told their friends. And the next thing you know, fastest growing water sport in the world, um, in the, in the last five years. But to put it in perspective, I read, read an article and, uh, I forget what magazine sup the mag possibly in so surfing, I think Duke Kahanamoko brought it in uh, sometime in the early 1900s to the U.S., from Hawaii to the U.S. shores. And they say in about 100 years, give or take, surfing in the U.S. grew to a few million, said a little over 2 million surfers in the U.S. And then paddleboarding, which was brought to the shores of the U.S. by Laird on that September 11th paddle, uh, within 10 years had grown to about two and a half million. So wow. it took surfing a hundred years, yeah. uh, paddleboarding took 10. And then where does it go from here? So if yeah. you look at a market like kayaks, uh, it's enormous, you know? And so, and the, di the reason is, is you can do it anywhere there's water. And if the learning curve is, yeah, if, if you can stand on two feet yeah. <laughs> and hold a broomstick, <laughs> uh, you're good. So, so it's, it appeals to everyone. So from, you know, little kids to grandmas to everyone in between. And then it's kind of had all these offshoots where there you got your diehard yogis that yoga on the water, which is amazing. Great exercise and takes you out of the, the studio. You got your hardcore race. Uh, then you've got just your leisure paddlers, uh, people with dogs. Animals love it. They love to take their pets. I mean, it's just kind of got all these offshoots. The, the kids now are really coming up. I've been reading some articles about the race scene with kids that are just like these little he-men. <laughs> yeah. And she, she women just going Cause it's huge, a, it's, taking out, you know, big name guys that who knows what they're going to be like in 10 years. So it's, it's, it's just crazy to where, where it's gone and, and the potential of where it could go. And it's definitely, in my opinion, I don't really think it's a fad. Uh, I think it's, it's here to stay for sure. I couldn't agree more. And I, I got a bunch of notes on all of that because that was one of the biggest features I wanted to talk about today, because I think that I, I have no idea the the background of all of the listeners, but I think my favorite part, so growing up on the water, um, growing up in Maryland, we had a place down in the Chesapeake Bay, which I've talked about in the past, but so it was right on the water. The only way that you got out on the water to go kneeboarding or crabbing or fishing was with a boat. And so you kind of carve out different um, socio scenes of, of who has enough money to afford a boat, who has enough money to afford a boat slip, who can live on the water, et cetera. And, the, and over the years, I've owned my own boat. I've had a wakeboard boat. I've had tons of jet skis. I've had all these toys. And I remember I had, at the time, I had four jet skis when I bought my first paddleboard. And I threw the paddleboard out and it was so insanely convenient because I didn't have to wash it. I didn't have to clean it up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't have to get oil. I didn't, I didn't have any maintenance whatsoever. And all of a sudden I was floating out in the middle at the time it was Rehoboth Bay. I'm floating out in the middle of the Rehoboth Bay. I had a little cooler with like three or four beers for <laughs> treat yeah. myself after a Friday work day. And I'm, I'm floating out there doing the exact same thing I would have done on my $6,000 jet ski. Uh, obviously two totally different experiences, but the one main staple or core was that I'm out on the water, I'm, I'm relaxing, I'm getting a workout and I'm just as happy as I would have been out on a boat or or a oh, wave yeah. runner. And so I think th that's kind of the first part of why it appeals to everyone. Because if, if there's any water around you, whether it's a pond or a ocean, you have yeah. the accessibility. The second part, as you started to touch on, is the different lifestyles now. So oh, yeah. fishing, fi that was, fishing is crazy. Big, fishing, I would say, is one of the biggest uh, growing segments. Fishing and yoga. Yeah. So those are those are growing just hand over fist because um, it's just so much more uh, on the fishing side, mm -hmm. um, you know, being able to stand up and have that field of vision. Um, 
you know, around 360, around your paddleboard and, and control of the poles versus sitting down and, and the speed you can generate getting place to place. It's just, it's just unlike yeah. uh, kayaking. It's got just a way better appeal, just standing up. It just gives you a much better perspective. I saw some videos on your website of when you guys went out in Catalina or catching <laughs> catching fish, which is pretty cool. Because oh, yeah. basically, if you if you do hook something pretty decent, the board's gonna go. The board's gonna go with the fish and basically <laughs> yeah. allow you to to grab more line faster than if you're stationary anchored in a boat. Um, the other thing, yeah. So so we already talked about cruising. We talked about surfing, fishing, the yoga scene. I see it all the time, just cruising around um, Coronado and Mission Beach, definitely in the Bay Area. But they'll they'll have these pockets where um, you know these these flat area pockets where they'll you'll see a group of anywhere from four to probably fifteen people out on a board, all gathered around, instructor in the front, and everyone doing full on yoga class on a paddleboard. Yes. So it's it's not even <laughs> like yoga on steroids. It's it's more than that because you have to balance the board, so your core oh, yeah. needs to be tight. It's an extra dimension. It so really is. It adds an extra layer of complexity for you know to to really hit the core and and all the muscles. And I'm a diehard uh, YouTube yoga guy because surfing, paddling, my whole life, my whole body, especially my back, I've had a lot of issues. So uh, so yoga is is my go to relief, and I haven't done much of the yoga the paddleboarding yoga, although I have done it a few times and it's incredible just because I'm out in the water every morning surfing or, or stand up paddle surfing, but, but it's an incredible workout and it just takes you out of the, out of the gym or the studio and you're just out there and you know, you may have dolphins come by or bird go by and just being able to do yoga, get that extra sort of uh, layer uh, of Serenity. complexity yeah. with, with the water moving under you. It's hard. It's very difficult. And it's really, really good for you to strengthen up uh, your core and flexibility for surfing or pretty much any sort of sport and just being out, out in the water. So there's a just a huge and growing um, following of stand-up paddle yoga. And it's also because not everyone has a, a big lake. Or, yeah, it's mostly done in lakes and bays. But another segment that's growing really, really quickly as well is just in pools. So now any sort of fitness center that has a big pool, they'll string up a group, uh, a large row of, of paddle boards and they'll offer classes and, and people love it. So so that's that's kind of a, <laughs> an, another offshoot that's kind of interesting that pretty much allows anyone anywhere where there's water to, to get on a, a board and experience. So I'm going to take that a step further because this is this is my favorite part is uh, I'm all about cutting the fat in my life. It, sometimes that means friends and stuff like that too, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> de definitely just sheer accessories. I don't want clutter in my house. I want to, I would just want to trim down as much crap, junk, shit as possible. And oh, one yeah. of the best things about what you guys do, and, I, and um, I don't know how long it's been out, but the inflatable paddle boards. So when you're talking about having a group in a pool or um, the ease of, of learning how to paddleboard, another element that makes it super easy is your inflatable paddle boards. And so I'm talking about anywhere from a 10 foot to your Megalodon, which is 15 feet by, how wide is that thing? Uh-oh, I should know. Uh, I think it's close to four feet. Okay, so 15 50, feet by four 50, feet. 60 inches. Which is marketed also as being able to handle at least five to seven adults. So the beauty with these inflatables is it rolls up, it goes into a into a backpack that essentially you could travel the globe in. You can, so for me, back when I had a Prius, I would keep the <laughs> paddleboard. Yes. Are you laughing at the Prius? <laughs> 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 no, I love Prius. Most people do. So I would throw this this thing in its bag, which holds the pump. It holds the paddle, which is in three pieces, and then it holds the um, the fin and it holds the the actual board. And so you would unroll this thing anytime, anywhere you want. You're inflated in four to six minutes tops, and you throw it out in the water, and you're you're good to go. Yes. So interesting. I can kind of tell you about our, our the beginnings of of the inflatable. So when paddleboarding's popularity first started, everyone it was hardboards, and that was it. And some of the things you just touched on. So since so basically since this inflatable uh, 
this inflatable paddleboard kind of hit the scene, which was really took off, what, 2014-ish? Yeah, so, something around there, I would say. So it's still Just really a, young. Yes, yes, it's very young. So very young. So you you were explaining that, that essentially the, the first couple runs was uh, a little bit of a giant balloon. You didn't really like the size. It didn't flow as better as well as the harder boards. Now that you feel like you've got that aced, I have noticed a ton of other companies in the market. Oh yeah. <laughs> so everyone's in it. <laughs> so everyone everyone's in it. Some people have the same model as you as far as direct to consumer. Oh yeah. Right up the street <laughs> is Tower Paddle Boards, which <laughs> they're now trying to take over Garnett Street with their giant retail location. Yes. So going back to kind of when you first got into this. Right in that Shark Tank fame. It's funny. <laughs> into the sunset. It's funny you bring squeezing that Squeezing every drop, last drop out of it. <laughs> You're going to need a new shtick soon. All right. So I'm going to talk about that for a second. I'm going to get back to my question. But I believe it or not, to when you and I were, and this is what I was going to tell you before I started and I decided not to share it, but now I am. <laughs> so when you and I were going back and forth and exchanging emails and I could not find a time to sit down with you and then I knew I was going back east for a couple of months, I was like, shit, I'm going to, I really want to get this genre on the podcast. So I reached out to him strictly to see what he would say. And Tower Paddleboards, I don't knock any company, but I'm going to explain this right now. So I, I throw the whole thing. Look, I'm curious. I know that you're up and coming. You got a, a really cool concept with your business hours, et cetera. Well, he's got no time. He's on the four hour work day. He <laughs> responded to me within 20 minutes, maybe less, maybe 10 minutes. And I got a long email, probably about six sentences long, explaining how he has no time, how uh, I don't have enough followers yet for it to be worth his time, on and on and on. And I sent a nice snarky email back. And I, I kind of kicked myself because I was pissed because I sold out a little bit. I talked to you a long time ago. I have an aisle paddleboard. I ride a paddleboard, not being cheesy, but... I was committed to you, your brand, and having you on, especially for your tenure in this game. And I sold out a little bit by reaching out. So <laughs> I got to serve my own medicine, but it's good because it put things into perspective. And that's the type of person I don't want to have on this podcast that thinks they're too cool for school. But getting back to that, yes, he was on Shark, Town, Shark Tank. He was promoting it. Um, they have a, a funny thing where they only work half days and then they paddle and have fun the rest of the time. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Yeah, that's why they still have the same product line from day one. <laughs> so that's exactly what I was going to get at. Is it's a stale product, and one of the things that that you've prided yourself on is you got into this game early from the the, the surfboard standpoint, and then you have morphed into paddle boards, and then now you morphed into the stand up. I think um, one of my personal favorites that you guys do, and I'll get into another part in a second, but one of my personal favorites from a product standpoint is I've seen just over the last three years, I've seen a big change in your product line where I think you listen to your consumers a lot, like the, the plastic handle on the board. I know you got rid of that this year. That was my one complaint about years past. The, um, the foot pad, foam, whatever that was, yeah. you change that to now like a flat, softer, different feel. That was yes. one of, that was my only other complaint from yeah, non abrasive. Yeah. That was my only other complaint from years past. So point being, there's a lot of people in the space. How do you stay ahead of the game or how are you confident in your product versus some of the other ones? Wow. <laughs> that, how can I, how can I dumb that down into under five minutes? <laughs> <clears throat> Well, it's it's many fold. Um, you know, I would say at the, the sort of the top tip top of the pyramid is really kind of understanding your your different sort of customer base and what people want and need through everything that f from from the past customers, customer emails, customer questions, reviews, and then um, trying to keep the product fresh. And so, um, you know, product is is key. If you, you know, you let your products go stale and you focus on too many other things and neglect the product, which is, you know, something we have done in the past where you, you've got too many other plates spinning and you have to just stop yourself and go, wait, we need to listen to our customers. We need to listen to the market and what's happening and we need to design fresh product that, that fits the needs of the market. 
And to do that is not easy <laughs> because uh, you're talking about a whole product line um, A to Z. So specking everything out, <clears throat> you know, using all this past data that's been accumulated over, you know, more than a decade to fine tune uh, everything in your line and, and colorways. And then after you sort of, you know, develop everything and, and get samples and tweak and, and, you know, add all the little bells and whistles and, and features and, and get a final product. Uh, you've then got to get out there and, and get product video, product shots out in the wild. And that's no easy task either with, you know, a whole vast product line of, I think now we've scaled it back on the paddleboard side, there's 12 different models or so. So just getting your products fresh, getting, you know, product, professional product photos, professional videos and photos of in the wild in different areas that really show that, you know, you've put just a tremendous amount of thought and, and effort in into your product line is is priority number one. And it's the most most work. The four hour work week <laughs> is not going to cut it. <laughs> Um, you're definitely going to be putting in some serious, some serious time, energy, effort, and money to make it happen with the hopes that um, it puts you ahead of the curve. And of course, if you go down the rabbit hole on your product line, don't listen to customers' needs, create products that people maybe aren't that interested in, your price points aren't right. Um, it's a balance. You know, you've got to have solid price points for that direct-to-consumer market that are competitive, where you can make enough margin to stay in business, attractive, attractive product, you know, attractive photos, videos, all the stuff I talked about before. And then um, when it, when you're firing on all cylinders on your product line, then you can sort of go down the list and start polishing everything else or, you know, in tandem, but products are, are number one. And, and we just really reined in our resources and put everything in to this new product line that we just released uh, here in the really just had the online release, I think a few weeks ago. Yeah. I was going to say, so, I got an email probably two weeks ago and yeah. new boards came in, I think last week. So it was shop. a long, um, and, and most companies, you know, you look at these, these companies that are, that are actually doing well, um, in a lot of them on the retail side and there's not many left. There's been a real sort of culling of the herd, if you will, where back in the day, if you just call Asia, slap your logo on a paddleboard and bring them in and put them in your garage, build a little hokey pokey website and you would sell them and repeat. And, and now, uh, you know, that game is over yeah. and even companies that are in the game that have great product have faltered as well because they're, they price themselves out of the market or they went and bought a $150,000 tour bus and hired all these race guys and they're just, you know, spending money in the wrong ways. And somebody finally picked up the books and went, wait, wait a minute, this is fun, but, uh, we're sitting on a ton of product and we're spending money down the rabbit hole and the company hasn't made money in two years. It's time to pull the rip cord or, you know, figure something out. So we've seen a lot of companies really trim their lines, go out of business, uh, or just have stale product and eventually will probably going be going out of business. So the boom, I would say, is still there, still continuing for those that are developing products that customers want. But at the same time, um, the people that are letting their product go stale and or spending money in the wrong ways and unfocused um, in the wrong ways are, are feeling the pinch and or have just folded. So we like that because, <laughs> you know, we, we like less competitions, always, always better, but the competition is still fierce out there. I mean, there's a lot of, lot of paddleboard companies, but uh, how many are actually making money? That's another, another question. One of the things that I like is that you started this as a passion project. So you you got out of the career path that you were in to do this as a avid, very advanced, skilled surfer. Are you and you've you've come a long way. Are you still that passionate about this company now that it is heavy on more of the beginner to intermediate paddle border? Does it still have your your passion? <laughs> You know, it's crazy. It's been such a, I mean, it's crazy to just look back at almost 14 years of have gone by and, and it does. And it, you know, 
when you're when you're running a company, you know, it always starts out fun. Your your passion. You're like, woohoo! I want to sell surfboards and travel the world, and and then it becomes real. It becomes a real business with you know employees and overhead and and you know goals and things that need to be met in order to stay in business. And, and it's hard, and it definitely wears on you <laughs> heavily. And and I would say, you know, paddleboarding kind of sort of rejuvenated my love for the business and just seeing it grow and seeing how fun it is and and the smiles on people's faces and it's just a a cool unique space to be in and so so yeah it's definitely you know it's up and down but as the business grows it keeps me motivated and the business has really continuously grown from from day one other than that little slow patch we hit for about a year when the surfboard market kind of got oversaturated so it's nice to kind of build something from nothing and see that growth um and and see the future as well which i think the future is very bright for the space and so so it's definitely kept me interested and we'll see see where it goes from here but i have yeah. some some interesting plans <laughs> nice. for the future so we're not going to get an exclusive <laughs> on here are we <laughs> yeah <laughs> so uh, this is this is going to be a long question i'm sorry but um i'm going to start with a statement and then turn it into a question <laughs> Um, and the only reason I say this is because I've gotten flack from some of my listeners about how I like to pretend I'm asking a question. I just throw out a statement. But so my senior project, which was a culmination of supposed to be four years, but I just did two years because I had transferred. So my senior project was about starting a water sports company. It was about having jet skis. It was about having um, surfboards, uh, kayaks. It was about having all these toys and how to start. Um, a, a chain of basically water sports rental toys. Um, I passed. I got out of school. So <laughs> <laughs> that's all that matters. Unfortunately, rental I never... Rental markets. Big, uh, big market. Uh, yeah. Well, I never... Water sports rental. It's tough. Uh, unfortunately, tough, I never went down that, that path. Fortunately or unfortunately. So why I bring it up is because um, on your website, this is one of my favorite things about your company is that, yes, it started with a product. However, you have morphed into a product and a lifestyle. And so on your website, down the, down the right-hand side column, there is everything uh, from blogs to different articles, et cetera. And there's these tabs and it has travel, fitness, events, gear guide, lifestyle, giveaways, business. It's a really cool and unique marketing plan. Um, but the, what I'm getting at is that you have these brand ambassadors that go out into the into the world and basically give you feedback on all of these categories. And so I'll, I'll ask you to talk about that. But first, one of my favorite things is this business standpoint. So it's kind of a, a double piece. I'm sure you get marketing out of it, but you are basically giving kind of the the cheat code or the inside info on how to start a stand-up paddleboard rental company. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so yeah, that all all those categories you talk about, that is that's our blog and and I actually started that thing way back when when everyone's like, you gotta have a blog. And so <clears throat> so I, I started that thing and initially started with it was just me traveling around the world uh, whenever I could get time away and and I'd post photos, try to go to places people never paddled before. And, uh, and it just kind of started as more of a passion project. And then now with, with content marketing online, it's really kind of morphed into a space for us to talk about, you know, things in the industry, all the little categories you talked about and, and actually, you know, try and, and drive traffic and interest to the website in hopes that people will will buy something, but also find something of interest. So try and give people something uh, they can they can uh, do while they're at work or bored at home. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, that's one of the pieces we wrote is, you know, how to start a, a SUP rental business. And it's it's been, uh, we have dabbled on the rental side, going targeting directly, you know, pretty much anyone on the water that has a hotel, you know, you have a mobile truck and if you're near water and you can get the licensing or not you can you can rent boards and it's it's great i mean you can you can have a great little side business and uh we've we wrote a sort of an article just to kind of uh, let people know what they what they need to do if they were interested and then on our site we offer just sort of bulk pricing so we don't have a specific 
rental fleet pricing, but we just offer deeper discounts when you purchase uh, six or more. Here's my shameless plug. <laughs> six or more units um, because our pricing, there is no sort of wholesale retail. We're direct to consumer. Our price is very, very competitive and good as is delivered to the door when you purchase online. So if you, you buy a, a bulk quantity, um, we give you a little break. But again, we're not focused at the retail, but we get, we have a little map it says rental locations mm -hmm. down in the footer. And I don't know how many are in there, but there's probably 20 or 30, maybe more locations across the country that have given us their information that you can get access it's really to our easy boards. To start. It yeah, really it's really, is. really easy to start. And it's a lot of fun. And it's a great add on if you've got an existing business, you know, be it a hotel or a resort. Um, it's pretty much a no brainer. Yeah. <laughs> And companies do really, really well. We have a couple of companies in San Diego that, I mean, they got the boards rented all day long, but it's very hard on the equipment. Yeah. So, so I mean, yeah, depending on how busy your operation is, um, people can really beat it up quick. So looking back, now that we've come full circle, you, you have officially made it. You're doing well. There's a, you have a warehouse, you have a retail showroom location, and then you also have this kind of corporate office. You're clearly doing well. You've ton, sold a ton of boards. What would you, what advice would you give to the younger you looking back <laughs> uh, slash entrepreneurs listening saying, I want to start something? Ooh. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would definitely, it might sound cliche, but definitely got to do something that you're passionate about because it will turn into a real business and you know, the passion fades. Um, but at least there's that flame <laughs> that, that hopefully still burns and, and may reignite. Uh, whereas, you know, if you, you find yourself doing something that you just don't like and you're just doing it to pay your bills, you've got to get out of that situation because it's a situation a lot of people find themselves in and it may work for you, but if you are, you have that entre entrepreneurial spirit. Yeah. First and foremost, you know, find something that interests you no, no matter what, whether it's, you know, a product or, you know, some kind of industry and, and kind of go that, that direction and, and see if, if you can, you can potentially have a business angle to start something, but it's scary what you're up against these days. And, and the way how fast everything moves, uh, it's definitely uh, you're in you're in for a, a wild ride, <laughs> <laughs> but exciting. And and it's crazy to see some of these companies, just the successes that can be had, especially like in the tech industry. You know, you see Snapchat just sold for or went public at twenty four billion dollars. I mean, that's just a twenty four year old kid that had a dream. And it's like, I want to I want to make have yeah. everyone have their own little little uh little show through this window of snapchat and look now he's worth 10 billion <laughs> i also think that there's a there's a big part of it though that is i'm i want to start a business for for me and freedom and to make it a lifestyle business oh, yeah. and then there's the other ones like a snapchat that have the full intentions or even maybe even an airbnb um, if you've heard their story like they went all in early with a yes. lot of money yes. banking on this is gonna set us up, we're gonna we're gonna get paid out and tap out. Not yeah. not planning yeah. on doing it as a lifestyle. So this, this is yeah, this is a very interesting situation. So so there's a couple ways to go about it. What we did is we I call it the shoestring method. <laughs> and we were able to pretty much start the business on a shoestring. We got a loan for twenty grand and pretty much just parlayed that through blood, sweat and tears and kept investors out and worked with the bank and really were just responsible and pretty much even to this day I've invested most everything back into the business to support the growth. And that is kind of the biggest lesson that I've learned is I always thought, oh cool, well, you know, you 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 make a bunch of money you split it 50-50 with your partner and then you start all over next year, but it doesn't really work. There's this interesting thing called cash flow and inventory and taxes. <laughs> and at the end of the day, if you're growing and you're growing at quite a you know substantial clip year over year, unless you have outside investment or you're putting every dime back into that business um, to support that growth, you, you know, you're, you're committed and, and there's really not much left. And it's hard to, to do it, but, but when, once you get to a point 
where you are able to to sort of taste taste some of the of the fruits of your labor you know it's nice and and that's the interesting thing where we never took on partners and we always had outside of of both of us because we've always had interest and there was always times where we could have brought in another person and it may you know have been a good thing or a bad thing you know another partner an investor can be really good in a lot of ways but it's also nice to just it's hard enough to make decisions with just two partners let mm-hmm. alone three and and so so yeah I, I would say you know at 14 years later I like that it's that we've kept it just just us and and no outside companies but if I had it to do all over again you know I may look early on at seeing how fast and how big I could grow in a shorter period and look at getting outside investment um, because because you can grow a lot quicker and a lot faster but at the same time uh, it you can you can stumble <laughs> just mm-hmm. as fast and so that's what you know growing slow over a long period uh, you know it really makes you responsible and you can learn from your mistakes without going bankrupt uh, whereas you know, if you come out of the gates swinging with a lot of investment money, you better you better have your your game plan uh, tight. Um, otherwise, your your odds of failure are very very high. But at the same time, hey, get the failure out of the way. You'll learn a tremendous amount in a short span, and then move on to the next to the next venture. And that's the American dream. <laughs> is unfortunately your 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 uh, reputation may be slightly tainted i think if you if you go bust with the first venture but that's the american dream and the beauty of of you know starting a corporation and borrowing you know investment money getting an outside investor uh you know if you go belly up hopefully it's with someone else's money but again that if you're starting <laughs> from from scratch it's really quite difficult to get Unless you have a you know rich grandpappy or you know you know the right people, <clears throat> if you've got a concept that hasn't really been proven, um, it can be very difficult to raise any money. But but if you've kind of proven something uh, as a concept, uh, things become a lot easier to raise money. And in fact, now with I've done some of the research in in uh, kind of this crowd crowdfunding and raising money online. And it's crazy. I mean, you see businesses that pretty much have done next to no sales and they're raising millions of dollars. So if you've got an an idea and a dream, um, I don't think there's ever been a better time to follow your passion, raise money and, and try and knock it out of the park. And if you do and you do it while you're young, hey. It's a really good take. But one of the other things that we've heard is uh, from some of the past people that have been on this podcast is that when you have that sense of uh, background, uh, backbone or, or support, when you have kind of the safety net of someone else's money or um, it, it puts you in a different spot oh, versus yeah. like you're in the corner. I threw every dime at this and I borrowed some money from somebody. This is like sink or swim. You better, <laughs> you better make yeah, it count. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. When it's your own money and, and you've got nowhere to turn and uh, you got bills to pay and your back's against the wall. Yeah. It's sink or swim for sure. Well, I, I think that's some really, really good advice. I'm going to wrap up now because, um, part of the, part of the reason that I need to wrap up is because, uh, Mark and the, uh, group of employees outside of this door are chomping at the bit to go on a nice, fun weekend in Mexico. And, <laughs> and sir, we love Mexico. <laughs> and I'm keeping them from it. So I started off and they were excited to probably meet me and hear that I'll paddle boards, uh, I'll surf and stuff was going to be on podcast, but now I'm cutting into their, their weekend. <laughs> <laughs> no, we love you. So, so stay, so, ask more questions. <laughs> so we have, um, All right. So as we wrap up here, um, we are going to do the final six questions here. These are all basically quick answers, but they are standard for all of the visitors that come on to the podcast. So first question for Mark, what are your favorite apps that are currently on your phone? (laughs) Some of these could be work related. Some of these could be uh, just random, but basically I feel like apps are just so hard to find and it's all referral based. So, you know what apps, does that include social media? Uh, <laughs> cause if it doesn't, you know what? I, I really, my phones at this point always seems to be out of space <clears throat> and I've never really gotten into the apps. Nice. So, so for me, 
Yeah, I do a light Snapchat, maybe do a light scroll of Facebook and and no apps. I feel like part point. of the reason that you say that. Oh, well, let me let me the app I, I do find myself using is Google Analytics. Oh, nice. So you can install it on your phone and track all your web web analytics that's and, a good and one. analyze in real time. So that's about it. And the light social scroll, scroll the feeds. That is a good one. And I think part of the reason part of the reason that you say that is because you have uh, you have so much going on oh, yeah. for Iowa. I mean, as far as all the different brand ambassadors sharing different photos from Instagram and um, just everything that you have from a company standpoint, I, I can see why you don't. We're uh, awash in data. <laughs> yeah. All right. So second one would be, I don't want to say favorite art, favorite music artist, but who is your kind of your most listened to right now in your Spotify, Pandora, iTunes world? I'm a huge, huge fan of Sirius Satellite, so I, and a big fan of the fist pump electronic music. So I find myself on on a BPM, the Chill Station, Station 51, 52, 53. 52, yeah. <laughs> uh, just can't get enough. Always have loved the music, and pretty much on that all day long, uh, or when I'm driving. That's I, about it. I agree. Big fans of them. Uh, number three, if you didn't start uh, aisle sup and surf, what would you be surf doing? And surf it's and always sup. a tongue twister. Sorry, <laughs> what would you be doing? Wow, that's a great one too. Uh, you know, I'm not really sure. I'd probably be surfing and paddling. Probably living somewhere um, tropical. Probably Indonesia. Have found something going on there, or or somewhere with good waves and and tropical weather, and finding a career there hopefully starting another business i don't know that sounds like someone who put all their eggs in one basket earlier and <laughs> didn't look back and i'm hoping to find myself there <laughs> soon <laughs> um with my future plans so we kind of already touched on it, but one tip for any young entrepreneur basically you alluded to have the passion have the drive and and go for it hard yeah i would say gosh one tip man there's just such an endless sea of things you need to know now but I would say, gosh, data and and now having an online, if going the online route or direct to consumer e-com business is is something really where everyone should be now if you're gonna be selling a product, is understanding digital and the analytics and data. So, you know, taking some data analysis classes, Google Analytics classes, really knowing how to pick apart and sift through data or using software to sift through data and make decisions because ultimately that's kind of the future of of where the world's going now just how to make sense of of all the data to make business decisions so the the more you can learn about that space i think you're, you're putting yourself light years ahead of of everyone out there totally agree and very very good advice uh all right We've asked everyone this one, and we always get different answers, but what is success to you? Success to me is being on a catamaran uh, in a tropical area filled with paddleboards, surfboards, fishing poles, and pulling up on some perfect waves and nice fishing with some cold beers in the fridge <laughs> and uh, with really nothing, nothing to do but maybe surf and paddle and fish and relax and figure out where you're going to sail to next. <laughs> it's a solid answer. And isn't that what you're doing this weekend? <laughs> Unfortunately, no, but it is something uh, sailing's caught my, caught my eye, especially catamarans lately. So uh, definitely trying to put together a future, future mission here, uh, set, set sail, hopefully, hopefully soon. Um, so that more to like, come on that. That sounds like you might have just given a little insight <laughs> on uh, what's next for Isle Paddleboards. Catamarans? <laughs> I don't want to spoil anything. All right, last question. Uh, why did you accept my request to do this podcast? <laughs> <laughs> you want the honest answer? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, as a business owner, being in business for 14 years, um, even with spam filters, I get hundreds of emails a day. So likes, uh, tower Stefan over there, uh, at least he answered you. Yeah. Um, most of them are pitches for something and there's just no time. So they all 99.9 either get caught by the spam filter or go to the trash and, uh, podcasting just seemed interesting to me. So obviously people, people love to talk. 
uh, about themselves. <laughs> and so I just thought it'd be cool to kind of share, share some stories about the company. And, uh, and then I also wanted to find out a little bit about podcasting as well. So definitely had an interest there and in possibly advertising uh, in the podcast realm and just knowing more about it, it's kind of a cool and growing space. So it was nice to get a little chat before the interview Agreed. about that. Agreed. So you heard it here first. The uh, first sponsor of uh, Vicariously is going to be Isle Paddleboards. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. I really appreciate it. I will stop taking up your, your uh, afternoon here so you guys can get off to your surf weekend. But I really appreciate it. In closing, um, I, I've wanted to have this sit down with you for quite some time. I really, really appreciate it. I think that your stories are awesome. And I think that the concept and how you guys got into this is really, really cool and beneficial to any and all listeners. Um, 13, 14 years in it. And you've, you've kind of set the precedent in my eyes, at least for uh, the inflatable world and, and obviously the, the surfboard world, how you got into that. So really cool insights. I wish you a ton of luck and um, definitely follow up with you down the road once some of these new ventures materialize. <laughs> and I think after we get at least a good six to 12 months under your belt, I'd love to hear how the this new 2017 line does in sales because it's it's pretty gorgeous. Yeah. it's Thanks for, for having me. It, it was a blast. My first podcast ever. Nice. Uh, it was it was good times and and no we're we're excited about the line and so far so good uh, we just had our earth day event where we kind of released all the boards and offered a little discount for buying two and we've seen just a tremendous uh interest and a, a lot of a lot of sales so it's a positive positive sign um that they're being well received so okay. so we're liking it and I'll give my last plug here. Definitely give them your website. Check out the website. Yeah, and we just did a full uh, website revamp. So the website's looking really good along with the product pages. And it's uh, islesurfandsup.com. And one of the other reasons I say to go there, and this is my last plug before we get out of here, is that they do a ton of giveaways. So not just for their paddle boards, but they've done some partner stuff with... Uh, Rumpel Blankets, I saw that online. M22, it's apparel company. You did the one with Woodsy sunglasses all around this kind of Earth Day, Earth Week. So uh, another reason just to check them out is a ton of giveaways. So if you want free stuff and yeah. you want to get uh, on their mailing list, yeah. definitely check it out. One other kind of cool feature we built into the site. So if you do end up getting a paddleboard, uh, one of the newer models, and you hashtag Isle Sup, uh, it basically will, you can end up on the product page for that product or the home page. So we have a new software that feeds live straight from all social media onto the website. So it's really cool. Nice. We've had a lot of a lot of interest. So now if you if you pull up any of the product pages, you'll see our our product shots at the top. And then when you scroll a little lower, you'll see a gallery that says share your adventure. So these are just you know, all of our loyal customers out there um, tagging themselves. And it's it's really funny to scroll through the galleries and just see them and they're dynamic. So they're always updating and changing. And it's a really cool feature that I think it's, you know, social proof is kind of a new direction. Everyone's headed and uh, we're excited to see see where it goes. But so far, it looks like uh, it's it's doing well. And it's funny to see, nice. see all the customers <laughs> that is across cool. the board. That is cool. Make Thank you famous on the aisle site. <laughs> Make you famous. <laughs> <laughs> it's the famous mark my pleasure thank you so much for joining us vicariously podcast yeah <laughs>